This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me. I finally have another chat to share with you with a local band, a band from Melbourne. This one is called Munt. You'll be hearing from frontman David Robertson, a.k.a. Spud. Now, Spud does have a noticeably Scottish accent, but I assure you, you are talking to the frontman of a band from the great southern capital in Australia. Now, the catalyst for the conversation is due to the launch of a new album from the lads. It is titled Pain Aruberus, and you're going to hear a tune from that rather soon. Just a bit of detail about this chat here. We talk all about the album, but we dive into other topics. Notably, we talk about the rehearsal space in which these guys occupy, and they share with a bunch of other gnarly bands. Worth the price of admission alone to this chat is that bit of banter there. The tune that I've picked to share with you is titled The Vengeful March. It's a great representation of what this album is all about. And once it's done, we're going to dive into the chat. Let's go. been tracking mate what's been happening in your world apart from this awesome release oh thanks man uh yeah not much it's pretty much been that's pretty much been most of my life um for the last like i don't know year and obviously getting more intensely every every single time um 
coming up as well. So aside from that, uh, some some side project stuff as well, which is kind of ticking away in the background. But this is kind of the main priority just now. So um, yeah. yeah, just uh, just doing that, doing a couple of bits. I do like some photography and stuff on the side as well. So just trying to squeeze as much of that in as I can around uh, the the mammoth task of self-releasing your own music and navigating oh. the, the many fields of digital of the digital realm and and the physical realm as well you know so yeah i've got questions about that the the former the physical i don't know too much about although i have released a book and i've got a print on demand service there which is fairly exorbitant but you know yeah. people people can have that option if they really want it's less than a quarter of the price i think if you buy it as a as the e-version but uh, I'll get to that, actually. I'll get to that. I want to talk about the music first, if that's cool. So Yeah, of course, man. When Dicey sent it across, and thankfully, he, he, I'm grateful to him, he sent me the whole EP. So I've had yep. a couple of listens to it this afternoon, given I work from home. Yeah, cool. So I like to summarise bands for the podcast sake, so people who haven't heard you before. And if it's okay, we'll pick a tune that's already out there. The tune that's already out there, I'll play it on the podcast as well, so that people yep. have an introduction to your music before the chat. But... I think people will agree that it's gnarly grinding death, and I chose death on purpose because I can hear the death metal influence there. Yeah. And something I like is there's plenty of variations in tempo, lightning fast passages, so there's that blitzkrieg, napalm death thing going on. But you segue into these menacing passages that would make Alex Webster from Cannibal Corpse blush. Do you think <laughs> I've got it right there? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's all quite flattering, to be honest. Like, um, there's definitely a lot going on there. And that's, um, you know, it, it's 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 really just a part of, like, every member's kind of influence. Um, the band has made, like, a lot of progressions over the couple of years that it has been, like, in a physical form. Um, and, like, every time that we've kind of brought someone else on board um, or another person's come part of it, we all, we all share a lot of influence into it. And uh, it's kind of, it's always ever evolving and changing as well. Like, that's, I think that's the thing is like, we're not really, none of us really want to put like a handle on, you know, like a, a decide, like a, like a genre that we want to do or like a group of sub genres or like whatever, you know, like it's just, mm. we all like the music that we like and the member, each member, like we all, I, I think that's what brings us kind of all together is that we all like, we all have a, a lot of the same music that we enjoy, but we also, all have completely different things that we enjoy that maybe one or two of us like as well. And then the other guys won't be so into that, but they'll be into something that we won't be into as well. And so we kind of bring it all to the table when it's like, it, it does make the writing process like quite uh, difficult sometimes because you're trying to like pick out a lot of ideas. Cause at the same time, we don't want it to sound like it's just a bunch of, you know stuff just all stuck together as well like we do quite try to focus quite hard on the songwriting aspect as well which is I don't know, maybe a bit of a weird thing for like a kind of grindy death band or whatever but like it's kind of it, i guess that's what we use to try and like you know form form the parts and like you know kind of like separate them in from each other because every almost every time you write a song it has like a different approach to it as well we don't really have like a set way that we approach writing or anything as well like Certain certain members will do certain things, like me and our other guitarist Saul, like do a lot of the kind of primary writing in place. But then everybody does their own individual parts as well. So, and that, that's the thing. It's like the, a song will have like a blueprint start, you know, that will have a kind of like you know, just a couple of ideas thrown in, and then as people begin to write their parts, if the if bass and drums and things get put to it and stuff like that as well, you know, like little changes and stuff start to come in and it's quite funny actually because like so, like there obviously is a lot going on in there and sometimes some of the descriptions that we get of the music like <laughs> it's it's really interesting to listen to hear what people like think of it because obviously we have an idea in our mind i think i read some the other day that somebody had done a review of the ep and they described it as like a cross between like the berserker and anil nathrak and i was like those are two mm. totally awesome artists but <laughs> it's not really what, I'm, what what we're going for but like it's cool that somebody would take that away from it and it's like the same thing with kind of what you're saying as well like we're all big massive napalm death fans and i think that's it with the whole fast and slow thing as well like we're all really into like our death and our grind and stuff but we're all like also really into like our stone or doom and things as well and um, ronnie and saul like our other guitarist and our bass player they play in like another band together that's like yeah very kind of down tempo doom based um very kind of like depressing it's awesome class traitor check mm. check them out they're really really good as well um so you know that's it right we've really just got 
you know, we like we like a lot of fast shit and we like a lot of slow shit, and we're trying to just mash that together in a way that, I guess, in one hand sounds refreshing, but on the other hand, it's like you know, we're not we're not exactly trying to invent the wheel or anything like that. You know, we're just trying to do what we want to do, I guess. So that's probably the short answer. <laughs> You do it well, and and how do you write music? Do you do it as a group, or do you share ideas via the uh, cloud? It's kind of a mix of both, to be honest. Um, like we, because uh, I we all kind of like have our own kind of studio setups at home, um, and like I said, like Sol and I will kind of like generally do a lot of the kind of primary writing, like on guitar, like like based on the guitars. And so we'll kind of like throw things together at home and generally put like kind of rough like program drums onto like some riffs and stuff. And then kind of like me and we'll we'll generally tend to go through things a bit. Tim, our singer as well, like he's one of these like really good singers that like is also like he's an instrumentalist as well. So he plays guitar, he plays drums and stuff too. He does a lot of like electronic things and has like a good kind of like idea of like uh, that kind of like digital side of music too. And he is just like a an infinite ocean of ideas and stuff as well. Um, so like he generally likes to get quite involved in like the actual musical writing process before he even, you know, like if we have a writing session together with him, like he'll come and he'll like put input into the instruments before he thinks very much about doing any kind of like vocal work or anything, you know, and uh, and it's pretty good like having someone else there that's just like, you know, can kind of pick apart. There's definitely been riffs that like have been made a lot better by just like him kind of being like, oh, what if we try this and kind of do this sort of thing. Mm. Um, but it just depends. There's other songs sometimes that we've like mostly put together like in our own studios, and then when we've taken them in, there's maybe not too many changes that have to be made. I guess it kind of just depends how we feel about each one, um, because we kind of sometimes get to the point as well. Like we're in the process of writing just now, actually, um, and we've got like a, a good pile of songs there that are like kind of in the. I, I think when I say finished before we actually hit the studio, the songs probably sit about eighty percent completion because mm. that's the other part of it. We tend to do like, not what I would say right, like writing when we go into record in the studio, but like we definitely like refine the songs and like there'll there'll be room for changes. You know, we're not going in there and being like, right, it absolutely has to be like this and these have to be the notes and this is what has to be there. Obviously to an extent like that is what's going on, but like we always like give it, a, leave it extra room to breathe and stuff, you know, so that we if we come up with ideas at the time, because some of the best ideas you have are just spontaneous in the moment, you know? Um, and sometimes it will be as well, like we could have a song in near completion and I'll be, um, you know, just maybe practicing at home and like messing about with a couple of parts and I'll just, I'll change one little thing and I'll be like, oh, wait, that sounds really sweet. And we'll change that over and then send it to the rest of the guys. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. Like what you can do now with them, um, you know, with being able to record digitally on a very, very low budget, um, mm -hmm. and be able to send it between band members and stuff. Like, I mean, when I started playing music and, you know, like started writing my own music and trying to record my own parts in my bedroom when I was a teenager. Like I would be recording guitar riffs onto like a little mini handheld recorder and then I'd be playing that back so that I could then write the harmonies and the and the chords and stuff over it, you know? Mm -hmm. So the fact that I can now like go into Reaper and like I can track as many Reaper. guitar channels space. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what that's what we all use. Um we're all we're all big Reaper fans. Shout out Reaper. <laughs> Um, you haven't gone to I use, so I use Premiere Pro so I'm obviously a musician with all the stuff here behind me yeah. but with all the content creation stuff I can use Premiere Pro for everything but was Reaper just the default or did you try other things and you landed there because you felt that was going to give you the best option so to speak uh, I've just I mean that's the thing I've just always used it um, it was one of the first doors that I kind of came across for like my own music production I because when I, I studied music um, back in Scotland and there we learned on Logic and Pro Tools yeah. Um, so yeah. I do have a background for that, but I just I, I didn't really enjoy them. I'm not really a Mac user as well, so like I was mm -hmm. kind of like that side of it. I was a bit like uh, like I can use it, but I'm not really comfortable with the interface and stuff. And you know, it just never really clicks with me. And then like somebody showed me Reaper one day, and I was just like, oh my god, this is exactly what I've been looking for. Um, and I think it's a great program. And it, and we all just turns out that we all just kind of used it as well for our own on home stuff and that, which is great because it means we can pretty easily send things between each other, like project files and stuff like that too. Um, which is really handy for sending things like Jared, our drummer, like, you know, like MIDI files, because we'll send him like, you know, basic drum MIDI. 
And then he'll take that and be like, you know, sort of, this is a blast beat section, this is a D beat section, this is a slow section, and then he'll just completely rewrite everything that's in there, whatever, and then he can send things back to us and stuff too. So, um, yeah, there's a bit of that, but I mean, like, the same time as well, like, we are, like, I don't know if it's becoming old-fashioned for a lot of bands now, but, like, we also do love to, like, just take a bunch of, like, random ideas into the room and just kind of, like, you know, mess around with them and just, like, have a, have a, have a, have a play around. And we've come up with some great ideas in the past doing that way. Sometimes you just do like six hours of nothing of like, you know, you get nothing out of it. You just like play a bunch of stuff or whatever and you play the riffs and you try to make it work in the room. But sometimes it's a problem as well with having like a lot of opinions and things as well. Like it can yeah. be like really driving, but at the same time, sometimes it can kind of like just become a bit of a mesh and you kind of end up all kind of sitting there in your own corner, sort of looking across at the other guys being like oh, uh, all right, where were we with this? Like, are we adding that bit in? Or like, are we going back to that bit? Or like, you know, so it just kind of depends. Can't force the creativity, I guess. So. It's interesting. It sounds like a democracy. Yeah, I mean, it very much is. Uh, it's, it, it's certainly musically, you know, when it comes to the kind of organization, the planning and the more kind of business side of the band, like I tend to take over a lot of those aspects um, just because I like, I think for certain aspects of a band, it's important to have like a kind of uh, a ship's captain, essentially somebody who can just make yep. the decisions without having to check in with everybody all the time or anything. Essentially, the the position of the band manager, you know, like I, um, uh, I I kind of believe that like obviously some bands will look for uh, like out, like management outside of the band, and like that can work really well and stuff, obviously. Um, sometimes, sometimes it can be a total nightmare. Um, but I kind of feel that like nobody has your own interests at hand better than you have your own, especially when it comes to your band. So, um, I kind of do a lot of those aspects, I guess. So, um, yeah, yeah, like the the musical side of it is is definitely like much more uh, democratic. Yes. Um, yeah. Just okay. Good. That's interesting because it sounds cohesive. It sounds like as though someone actually writes the music and then brings it to the re- writes the bones of the track and then brings it in, whether they write it on a drum machine or map it out using any one of the programs online that are available these days. Brings it into a rehearsal studio and people learn their parts maybe beforehand and it's just hammered into shape there. But it sounds like as though you're actually doing things in an old school way. Yeah, I mean, we kind of are like because we're not. We, again, we like to use the digital tools and things like that. But you know, we went we was we went the same way with the recording as well. You know, the way that we recorded the CP um, is quite different. I mean, we've kind of done a different thing for every time we've recorded because this has been like the first like real big proper recording project that we've done. Everything that we've kind of done before this has just been like seeing how it goes basically like trying different things trying different people trying different methods and stuff but none of it was really like set like this is how we want to do it um mm-hmm. but when we recorded pain Ouroboros with luke and uh, walton at danger tone studios shout out yes. luke and danger tone he's a bloody legend um yeah we 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 kind of spitballed ideas with him and stuff initially and we decided you know because he knew uh, he knows us quite well as a band and stuff and how we like to operate and he knew that we wanted like a much more kind of natural idea behind it and um, to match the kind of like way that we go about things anyway mm. um so that's why with like you know with the drum recording in pain or boris there's no those are 100 percent natural drums there's n- absolutely no sample replacement or anything on there at all um there's there's no triggers those are all natural kicks and stuff as well there's nothing blended or anything at all um everything that you hear on that record is like um, is a is a a real a real thing uh, making the air move and making those sounds and stuff without wow. any trying to blend anything in, which is quite, um, you know, like we obviously had, there was a big kind of discussion about that because obviously like a lot of modern metal, like, um, I think it really depends like who you're talking to because like anybody that knows anything about production knows that like what it takes to make modern metal sound good and sound big, you know, like if you're talking about like kind of more popular bands, this is obviously getting away from the scale of your more kind of like grindcore black metal DIY, you know, record on a one track in your fucking shed or whatever. Like, you know, that stuff's cool and it's totally got its place. But for like big, bigger production metal and things like that, you know, I mean, I think like everybody who to, who knows and takes it seriously knows like what it, what is involved in that process and the, and the mixing and blending of natural sounds plus the, the digital realm bringing into that as well. Um, and just and you know just the mi- mixing the tools to basically get to to make the project or whatever it is sound how the how the how the person wants it to sound 
Um, so yeah, like, yeah, we have a, we have a kind of natural, natural way of doing things old school, I guess, like all these words kind of fly around again to us. We're just kind of doing things that what sounds good in the way that we mm. want to do things. Um, we're very fortunate again, that we have a, that we work, have an engineer like Luke to work with and he has a beautiful studio filled with very, very expensive equipment that he, you know, um, knows how to work very well and get great results from. So we couldn't have achieved these kind of things like without him. I mean, obviously there's other studios, there's other people out there. He's not the only person doing this thing, but you know, he was a real driving factor in pushing us to have the confidence to do that. Um, so yeah. yeah. Maybe I need to interview more local bands then, especially bands from Melbourne, because Luke's pulled a great sound, but he didn't just record it. He mixed it and he mastered the EP, sorry, as well. I haven't, I, to be honest, I haven't heard of him before. So can you give me a bit of context around him and Danger Tone Studios? Like who else he's worked with? Yeah, yeah, totally. So um, Danger Tone Studios yeah, is based here in Melbourne. Um, and Luke has worked with the likes of King Parrot, um, uh-huh. bands like bands like Remains. Uh, he used to play guitar in a bunch of bands as well. Um kind of like very old school kind of Melbourne death bands. Uh, I'm trying to remember what some of them are called now as well. Um, uh, Blunt, Blunt Shovel was one of those kind of main ones that he played um, guitar mm. in. Like he's also an incredible guitarist as well, but he's been kind of involved in the engineering and the mixing side of it. And he's very much like one of these engineers that's like, you know, not very big on social media, not very big on promoting himself, very uh-huh. much like, you know, has created the world that he has. And um and you know lives lives in that world which is fantastic because it's like we we rehearse there at the studio as well as record there and that's why we ended up recording there because we had been rehearsing there and writing these songs for probably about a year before we hit the studio and luke had been there the whole time like he mm-hmm. kind of we we kind of knew him a little bit when we started fra- rehearsing there we actually just really liked the studio because it's like it's such a gorgeous premises and he's just such a great job of it um yeah that we yeah we we basically just got to know him like over the time we were there because when we weren't in there jamming or whatever we'd obviously be like out in the in the green area just like hanging out punching darts drinking cans talking about metal and the world and whatever the hell was going on um Sounds and awesome. this was all this yeah it's, it, it, i mean dude it's a it's a totally awesome place like danger tone is like our second home and it's like that for a lot of bands as well like there's uh, some nights where we go there to rehearse and you know the the all the other bands or like people that all know each other and that and it ends up being a nightmare for trying to be productive because it kind of just turns into a bit of a party everyone oh, just kind yeah, of stands yeah. about goes in, in and out of other people's rooms and like you know just kind of with someone set up and playing people all coming in and out and watch and stuff and but it's it's a really nice environment you know it's um it's it's breeds a lot of creativity um and and yeah looks just an incredible engineer like you know a lot of experience under his belt not afraid to like tell you his opinion but also like never feels like he's trying to like force you down a certain way or like anything like that too just just a kind of perfect mix you know like again we've worked with a bunch of different people from recording various different stages of it you know from producers engineers and stuff like that and we're all like generally i like to think that we're all pretty easy to get on with you know we all just like to focus on the music there's not any real you know there's not really any bullshit with us or whatever you know there's not people like turning up to the recording studio like hammered on day one or whatever or anything like that you know like we all just kind of like are there for the music and things and and that's what they're like there as well you know so it's just it was just a natural place for us um like like i said um because we've been rehearsing there um and we we made the decision to record there because we were like well the songs have essentially been born in their live form in this in this place and you know luke's been there the whole time like listening to us and you know um like giving us like feedback and things like um when we've when we've wanted it and when we've needed it and stuff um and so it was just an it was just a natural thing to record with him and it was such a it's such an amazing process it was one of my favorite recording experiences of my life probably being in there for like the 10 days i think that we did a lot of the main tracking in one part um and just great i mean that's what i mean it's like where all of our other side projects and stuff rehearse in the same place too sometimes you just go along and hang out even if you don't have a rehearsal or if there's anything going on watch some <laughs> other bands that are going on there like hey so yeah yeah it's got some good units and stuff going in and out of there so yeah sink cool. sink tins and play darts and play pool man that sounds like a great after great way to spend your afternoon and listening to all of this killer death metal and grind and black metal yeah and, and that's else. what's 
that's what's cool about it, man. There's a lot of really interesting bands in there, and there's <laughs> there's some bands in there, man, that don't that rehearse there, that don't even have a name, and that don't play live shows, and they are like amazing. You know, there's like some hobby guys there that just like they just turn up every single week, you know, and uh, without fail, and just like uh, yeah, have a couple of beers, a couple of smokes or whatever, and then they go in and they just play like the most sickeningly awesome like prog death metal you've ever heard we're all we're all like this particular group of people we're talking about we're all like trying to push them to like do the live thing but they just like playing music they're all like quite socially awkward guys and stuff as well and they're not really like interested in the whole like you know the uh the i i guess like the show the show the show business side of being in a band yeah. if you'd call it or whatever you know they just like playing sick riffs and like others because they're doing that and they're not thinking about the band aspect they're just amazing their music's just incredible so yeah it's really there's some really cool bands there um, and a good mix as well yeah there's like bands like uh outright which are like a melbourne hardcore band who are amazing they've been around for a while and um, rehearse out of there and stuff too so again you just get like a good mix of people from different genres um not all heavy music as well there's plenty of you know acoustic and jazz and Stuff like that there too. So yeah, it's a good place. It's hard because awesome. it's like I want it. I want it to do well, but also like it's starting to get a little bit difficult to book rooms there sometimes because it's getting so busy. So I'm kind of being like trying to have to push it back a little bit because otherwise we're not going to be able to go there all the time. <laughs> when I was living in Sydney, I used to rehearse in at Rydalmere at a place called Warehouse Studios. Long since gone, as a lot of these old things are. This is early two thousands, and I had exactly what you're talking about. They're a hobby band in that we just couldn't get a vocalist so look fuck it we'll just go and play this music that sounds like a cross between primus and megadeth effectively that's kind of like where we sort of sat in the middle of and yeah it was a bit like that people would sort of come in and hang out and you could buy a beer for about four bucks or something like that or three bucks or something like that i mean you're driving so you could have two maybe three depending on how far you want to push your luck <laughs> yeah. but I, I remember those days and, and i've got to say that I don't think I've talked about this on the show yet, but uh, I reckon I developed a lot of my chops from that era. Just the stamina. I mean, just the ability to stand there for two or three hours. And sure, playing shows too, there's no question, but I'm talking about in the lead up to being able to play shows consistently like I'm doing now. Yeah. That was in my late teens, early 20s. And there's something in that and there's something about what you're talking about there, community. And I don't think there's quite enough of that going on at the moment. So it's really cool to hear that you've come from an environment like that. Yeah, and I mean it's these it's it's difficult to find these things. I, mean, I, I guess when you're talking about it in hindsight, it kind of feels like it all like naturally connects, and you kind of you know you find the places that you're supposed to like you know the ener the right energies like connect people together and stuff like that. And I guess part of that's true as well. But uh, I I certainly feel very fortunate because I had a similar place before I before I moved over to Australia from Scotland, I had a kind of similar place back home in Glasgow that I thought I would never find anything like that ever again. You know, just a real like, yeah, community based, like feeling studio, like just great people running the place, you know, um, great experiences there as well. Um, did lots of recording and stuff there. And, uh, you know, it was, I, I never thought I'd ever find anything like that again. And now it's like, I think about it quite often with like the kind of like environment that we have here now. I'm just like, it's like even, it's kind of even better because it's obviously all built built upon over time and stuff like that too. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's very fortunate. And I guess as well, like, yeah, in, in, you know, in the music industry and bands and genres and stuff can be quite funny sometimes. Like there sometimes can be quite a strong community feeling, but sometimes you know, people let dramas and stuff get in the way in that as well. And it's can, you know, it's take the t attention away from what it should be about, which is basically just the music. So, but I guess that's what brings the kind of people together as well is the fact that like, yeah, just, you know, everyone just wants to play cool music and hang out and, you know, support people. And even if it's not what you're into, still be like, that sounds awesome or whatever, like you and that too. So mm. yeah, it um, is a very nice, very fortunate. I'm reminded of a quote, where there are musicians, there are dickheads. <laughs> yeah those are generally the managers that i was talking about <laughs> earlier um yeah no i mean that's it man it's like you know you get you get dickheads everywhere and we and there's just dickheads that come in and out of the studio at that studio and that as well but uh <laughs> they tend to not like hang around for too long or whatever like i think they kind of feel the energy direct towards them and be like oh um but yeah no it is very fortunate in that place that it's a it's a very good like circle of people in there and stuff so yeah we're very fortunate to have that and that they kind of um thing like really breeds creativity and stuff as well you know like you kind of all just like boost each other up and you know um 
give each other like confidence and things like that too. So it's uh, it's a nice feeling, I guess, in a world that's becoming ever more digital and people are becoming less connected in a physical form and stuff. You know, it's good to just be in a place where you can actually just, you know, yeah, physically talk to people, listen to their music, you know, share a beer with someone, mm. you know. Um, it's okay. it's cool. You, you hear cool stories, man. I mean, that's what I mean. It's like King Parrot and stuff, like rehearsing in there before they do their tours and stuff. So we'll sit around and have beers with those boys and hear ridiculous stories from days <laughs> gone by and stuff like that. That you're just totally like, you know, it's it's really really funny. So some situations, you know, that you're just totally like, God, I never thought I'd be sitting here having this conversation, um, mm. with with this person or whatever. Like, hey, so, um. I mean, it is like it's like Yogi from Parrot. Like, I would never have imagined him to be the business mind behind that band. <laughs> from like only yeah. knowing his stage persona and like seeing in videos and stuff like that, and then after sitting down and having several conversations with him, <laughs> I'm just like, holy shit, you're like the prince of the brains behind the operation. I'm like, mm. I don't know, I don't know if that like how offensive that is, but I'm just like, I did not cop you as being the uh, the guy. That's no, not offensive. That's your observation, and he's a very interesting guy. He's uh, he's been pretty open about his struggle with addiction yeah. and he's completely sober these days as far as i'm aware i would yeah. I, i've had a few opportunities but miss them being a bit like ships in the night to have him on the show but i'd love to dive into his evolution as an artist because yeah. you you can't be as busy as what those guys are even though outwardly they look like they're a bit of a mess they're far from it they've uh, got that's shit yeah, that's- together big time Absolutely, man. And that's one of the things that we've like, you know, because we've got to know those guys and stuff as well. We've played a couple of shows with them now, too. And it's like so true. Like they like you say, you can't be that successful and be just a bunch of like idiots, you know, like there's got to be some kind of like um, operation in there. And although I'm saying like, you know, Yogi's a business mind behind them, like they're all very, you know, when 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 it's game time um they're all extremely professional. Um, and it's quite funny, actually, when you see it like from a side stage, you know, perspective going on because there's you know all the kind of like goofing around and that in between and then it's like you know when it's business time it's business so yeah that's nah, good it's definitely definitely how they are totally adjacent point just talking about glasgow is it still very dangerous over there if you're a fan of rangers or celtic and be in opposition territory <laughs> rangers or celtic uh yeah, yeah like it's um it's not as bad as it used to be. I mean, it's definitely, you know, the old firm kind of stuff and that was definitely like kind of the days have gone by a little bit more, but uh, it is it is a little bit more interesting over there, I guess. I, I thought it was quite funny when I first moved over here and um, and I saw uh, um, people were telling me about footy games at the MCG and they were like, oh yeah, it's all like mixed stands. We all just like go to the same pubs together and have beers and watch the footy and you could have beers in the stadium and stuff like that. And I was just like, I couldn't believe it. Cause I was like in Glasgow, they have to let the separate sides into the stadium at different times. Yeah, <laughs> you know, terrible. they can't even, yeah. they can't even let everybody go in the same door or whatever. Yeah, and there's absolutely no drinking at the stadiums as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit of a different world over there, but um, I think the unfortunate, I mean, again, this is kind of one of those conversations that's for a different time, but you know, there's a lot of uh, religious Oh, sectarian Stop. undertones. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yes, it's it's it very much intertwined in all of it. And so I think that's what kind of puts me off about it. It's, it kind of makes me a bit gutted, to be honest, because it may, it's what really put me off a lot of sports things like growing up there, because it was less about like, the you know, the sportsmanship in the game and more just about like what colours you were wearing or like, you know, where your family was from and stuff, which was... Mm just dumb you know which is why i kind of get envious of people over here when it's like i see like the way that things like that are over here and um you know it's a much more family friendly event you know and i'm just like ah, i probably would have been more into it um or whatever then but uh yeah i mean i don't know like glasgow's not really i think it got voted like the most like dangerous city ever somewhere but then also like the most friendliest city in Europe or something like that. So the saying with Glasgow is that like you'll get stabbed, but somebody will call you an ambulance. So mm. you know, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to think. Well, well, I think this is this has been a truism. Anywhere is a dickheadsville after midnight, and if you want to find trouble in any city, you will find it. It just depends on what your intentions are. Yeah, and I think the thing that people get, especially non-Scottish people that go to Scotland, the problem that they have is that every Scottish person after like a certain like you know after after a pint or two or even after just a certain time of day or even at a certain time of day most scottish people sound like they're angry you know 
like when they're just having a normal conversation or whatever, like if the voice is like slightly raised or anything like that, I think like people like immediately kind of get quite intimidated sometimes and are just like, I can't tell if you're really angry or not. And it's just like, no, that's just the way we sound, <laughs> you know? So I think that's, yeah. I think people from outside come into it and they hear like, you know, a couple of thousand Scottish people down Socky Hall Street on like a Saturday afternoon and they're just like, Jesus, man, everyone sounds like they're absolutely furious with each other. <laughs> it's just like, nah, man, that's just the way we talk, man. Eh? It's just how it is. <laughs> I've got mates in Scotland and I think they've mentioned some similar stuff actually. Mates that I've known got to know through the podcast. Yeah. And it's, one thing though is we're, we're we're so similar. The British and the Australians are so similar. So I, I know the guys, some of the guys from Cradle of Filth and some of yeah. these other groups. And and after a while, I can't even tell that I'm not talking to someone from Australia or yeah, even I mean, someone I, from Australia. I think that's why I like living over here so much as well, is the fact that like, especially humor wise, Scottish humor and Australian humor is you know, um, it's pretty, mm -hmm. it's pretty fantastic. We can all laugh at very dark things, um, <laughs> which is, which is fine. There's only finite, there's only a few countries I can live in in the world where I can get away with, you know, like laughing at some of the darker things in life and, uh, you know, and throwing the word cunt around, like it's absolutely nothing, you know, which is, fan, mm -hmm. you know, fantastic. So, um, uh, yeah, there's definitely, definitely good similarities there. Nicer mm -hmm. weather here though. That it is, yeah. About the music again, lyrics and actually, first of all, your vocal technique is a hell of a thing. Is again, is that something you've developed or is that something that you already had and you've just worked on it? Uh yeah, I mean it's kind of been under I guess development. Uh I don't know. I guess I'm always kind of like looking at different ways to make the technique more comfortable. Like I I, I do um I kind of got to a point where like I got my voice to like a, a rate, like a range and like a sound that I really liked. Um, and then from there, it was kind of about just trying to make it as comfortable as possible. Um, doing that kind of voice is extremely strenuous on the vocal cords. Um, mm. Those kind of like high shrieks and stuff like that tend to be like, you know, um, a little bit tougher than like lower growls and stuff like that. But for me as well, like I, that's kind of like my only, it's my only kind of projection that I do. Um, so it was just kind of about getting that kind of comfortable, I guess. But saying that as well, like, I'm really not a technique person, you know, like I don't watch videos about like technique or anything like Tim or our main, our lead vocalist is much more into that side of things. And um, he obviously has like, carries a much, much wider range in his voice. And so like, he is like, um, a lot practicing a lot more constantly. Um, and his own time and stuff like that. Um, whereas I probably do a little bit less of that. Like mine is, I kind of feel like mine is more kind of emotionally driven, I guess. Mm. Um, so I kind of like, you know, just it, the best of it kind of, kind of comes out in like intense moments or whatever. Like, I don't know. It's uh, it's a weird thing to kind of like to, to put into the mind, I guess. Um, because in a live situation, when you're playing and stuff, you're obviously got the adrenaline burning through you. So that's the easiest time to do something like that. Um, you know, I, I think I developed the voice doing things like that when I was playing in bands way back when, when I was a teenager and I was, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I just, I think I just got a microphone one day and just set it up um, when we're at practice or whatever. And I just started doing backing vocals and then somehow I pushed through to that voice or whatever, and then would, you know, do it live and stuff. And I found it was obviously easier to do live because you're already bursting with the adrenaline stuff. Um, but then again, through just like practicing it and rehearsing and I do vocals in a side project um, with a couple of other guys where I do all of the main vocal parts um, as well. Um, so that's definitely helped a lot. I've been doing that project now for about a year and a half, nearly a year and a quarter, I would say. Um, so doing that project has definitely helped because I use the same kind of vocal technique um, okay. and stuff in that. So it's definitely helped kind of build it up a bit. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess that's it. Like it's, I'm not really much of a big technique person. Like I, I, I like to drink um, licorice tea is my, is my go-to. Um, <laughs> I'd say, yeah, lic licorice root tea is what I always recommend to people. Like hey, that, that before licorice and root. ice cream okay. for after. Or whatever, eh? but uh, I think the more you do it, you get used to it and stuff. You know, if I have a couple of weeks of no rehearsals and I don't use my voice for a bit, the first session can be like a little bit scratchy or whatever. But um, mm. I think I've got quite a high standard as well because sometimes I'll be like, my voice sounds like shit. <laughs> Everyone else will be like, it sounds absolutely fine, mate. So, um, 
Well, yeah, I, I guess self awareness kind of though. That's a that's a great thing within a band. I've personally worked with far too many musicians that lack self awareness and get on stage and fuck up song after song after song and then get off and want to have a beer with you and you just want to punch them out. Yeah, I know it's all totally <laughs> singers, especially yeah. am right. <laughs> uh, but it's yeah, guitarists. To be honest, it's been guitarists. I've had virtually no issues with drummers. It's the guitarists, and I play guitar too, not just bass. And that's where I've been a bit frustrated that I know how to play the song, and it might even be four chords because I play covers. I call out myself. You mm-hmm. know? From the perspective that I, I don't, I think I've played in a few new metal bands back in the day, but uh, I love playing live, and you just don't get to play live up here that often if you play metal. There's mm. the back room and a few other places, and you've usually got to get them the support. And I'm not uh, – I, I just love playing in front of people, especially the yep. ladies when they're dancing and, and stuff. But if you're playing yeah. Get Lucky by Daft Punk, it's got four chords in it for fuck's sake. Yeah. you think that some people would learn it. And by extension, I have played in originals bands and people who get on – some people get on stage and they freeze up. We've all seen. I've never done it, but I've seen people who do that. Yeah. You can forgive that, but it's just that that willful negligence around things, especially when you when you mentioned what you said. I bet anybody listening to this, I would say that take note of what what you've just said. Then be self aware, be self conscious, be critical of yourself too, so that you're constantly improving. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, I think it's absolutely necessary because we're all learning all the time. I mean, that's again talking about like the voice or whatever. I think even like subconsciously, like I'm. Um, I'm building on it all the time and like you know it's like that's what you should be doing as a performer as a musician like you should be always being critical i mean you know gojira like after they perform every show they record everything on video and take a live mix from the desk and after every single show they play the first thing they do is go backstage and they watch the performance back you know and um, wow. yeah i know it's like absolutely amazing and uh, dedicated you- yeah, I mean, that's like a level I probably would never go to unless I was maybe my band was that big and I'd be like, right, okay, that's it. We cannot make any mistakes ever. Um, but that, t- yeah, that tells mean, you everything about the mindset you need to get to the top, though, because they're about near the top. Then, you know, massive. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, yeah, look how incredible they are as well. You know, people might be like, well, wow, that's really full on, but it's like, yeah, but look how, look how good Gojira sound live. <laughs> like, you know, it's not a lot of bands that can play music like that, that tight and sound that good. Um, and, you know, especially like playing guitar and doing vocals at the same time, I'm just like, man, that guy, he can, he's got, he's got the moves, you know, and that's, that's, that's not people that are just like woke up one day and we're just like, oh, this is what we're going to do. That is rigorous training and mm-hmm. rehearsal, you know, to the point where it's like agonizing. But that is the sacrifice that needs to be made in those points. You know, it's like, if you want your music to be that good, um, that's the attitude that you need to have towards it. Um, and not everyone has to be like that. Not every band has to be Gojira and be super tight and, you know, massive productions and stuff like that too. But I don't know, it's your music, you know, as well, or um, it's music that you enjoy. So it's like, yeah, you should, you should be critical enough with it. But yeah, it's like you say, some people just, uh, you know, think, think that they don't need to get any better or whatever. And those are generally the people that need to get better the most. <laughs> I can't be around them anymore in a rehearsal studio or on stage. It's it's far too difficult. I've got kids, you see, in a job, you know, work a journalist, I work during the day and I'm also married and, you know, I've got basic things, lawns to mow, guinea pig yeah, cages to life. clean and stuff and <laughs> life, all of this life stuff. I go swimming a lot, you know, swimming is my activity. Yeah. And uh, you think this is the thing we do for fun. This is our outlet. You're, you're at a different point with it because you've got the original thing and you know this killer release and it kind of needs that sort of dedication i just want people to be consistent and turn up and know the music that we're playing because it's covers for god's sakes it's already there go mm-hmm. and have a look how many youtube for every popular song whether it be journeys don't stop believing or what have you there's literally hundreds of playthroughs and helpful videos on youtube and the like so it's uh yeah it's just about the mindset that it takes to be successful, but there's another part to success, and it's something that we alluded to at the beginning of the chat. That's the social media strategy. Mm-hmm. Now, now this one here is probably the riddle wrapped in the enigma for a lot of bands. So, what's your approach been to it? Have you had to pump a lot of money into the social media side of things, or are you taking a more organic approach? Yeah, I mean, we tend to not really like pump that much money into it now. Um, you know, there was a time when things like Facebook and Instagram were kind of a little bit in their younger days, um, where I think it was a bit more beneficial. But I mean, essentially now they're just trying to extort more money out of artists. Yeah, great. Um, yeah. 
you know it's essentially i mean this is it as well though you know like you're never going to get anything in life for free um and especially not marketing or pr or any of those things you know like those things all cost money um regardless of what people think and if you're in a band and somebody's offering you free marketing or pr or free management or whatever run away don't even reply to the email you know what i mean because there's so a lot of them not... around though mate sorry to interrupt but there are a lot of local ones around and i hear them doing their own podcasts and stuff and i think what yeah. fucking expertise are you bringing to the table that means that you can ask for a you can ask for a you can bill people exactly. money for this so-called expertise like what is it well that's it exactly yes and it's just like people is you know people are generally like that are not doing these things because they have interest in the bands or whatever they're doing it because they don't want to get a you know a, a nine to five job or whatever so they think like i'll extort these it. bands and, and it depends like you know some of these people like are just you know fresh out of music media college and you know they want to start a promotions company and they want to help some local bands out and it you know i mean you know maybe it just goes a bit off the rails because they just lack the actual experience it's not actually malicious they're just young and inexperienced and in a certain sense you know like we all have to we all have to get up there at some point you know we all have to like fail in order to you know succeed um yeah. and things like that as well but i think certainly when it becomes to the more malicious side and it's more like you know um yeah just the kind of like extraction of a lot of money and like not a lot of result or anything back and that's kind of where i feel like it's gotten to with a lot of social media as well it's all being directed away um you know from the artist's control um and it's a frustration. I feel it's a, it's a very necessary evil. I think that's the only way I can describe it as a necessary evil because obviously, you know, there's the thing, the whole digital realm of things like Spotify and things like that as well. Obviously, it's not much of a secret how much Spotify makes and how little they pay their artists um, and, you know, various other platforms and stuff like that as well. But, um, you know, I, I heard somebody talk about this once and it always it's always stuck in my mind where like, um, you know, when I when I was younger, as a teenager, or whatever, and I had like my first job or that, and I would make like you know fifty dollars a week or something like that, and I would take that money to the record shop and I'd buy like two or three CDs or whatever. You know, yeah. like I was fortunate. I was fortunate that I could do that. You know, like that I could. That I had a job as a teenager. I was making my own money. I could go in and I could buy CDs and stuff. But there's a lot of kids out there that like can't do that. You know, um, they don't have the means um, anymore, and especially with bands putting out less kind of like cheaper versions of physical copies now a lot of bands when it comes to physical stuff are releasing like super cool splatter limited edition 12 inch vinyl which is fucking sweet but if you're like a 14 year old kid you know what i mean that's like a month's worth of pocket money or whatever like hey and, and again that's if you're lucky enough you know some kids that are living in a much lower socioeconomic area and side of things and stuff too like maybe can't even stretch to afford that you know like um and especially like the way a lot of things are going now so i actually think that things like spotify can be pretty good in that sense that like you know a, a family membership for spotify costs like 20 dollars a month and the whole family can have unlimited music for their for their whole lives basically you know for their for the month or whatever that they're paying for that and so it kind of sucks you know because it's like on the one hand there's the 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 people that you know the the owners of these companies and the you know the board members and stuff that obviously make like the the big salaries and stuff but at the same time um it's getting music out there to places where it would never have really been before um you know like people that maybe never would never have been able to consume as much music as you know they'd, they'd be they maybe be limited to buying like one cd every couple of months or something like that you mm -hmm. know and they can now stream and listen to as much music as they want and i think that's kind of better you know because for me it's not about making money from it like obviously i'm talking about them taking revenue and stuff but it's more just the uh, the acts of it um i'm i'm not really interested in in making money i'm playing underground death metal do you know what i mean if i wanted to make money from music i'd be in a pop band yeah um but yeah it's a kind of a, it's a double-edged sword you know um it's like the same thing with home recording like it's it's amazing now that you can do these things with technology on a very extremely low budget and you can basically mix an entire album yourself um you know in a day <laughs> you know from yeah. by spending like almost no money at all which is fantastic because it means there's an opportunity for a lot of music to get out there it does unfortunately mean that a lot of music gets out there that should never see the light of day <laughs> so there is like a very big oversaturation of things now i guess in all genres or whatever but um yeah it's you know it, it is what it is so it's uh, like i said the necessary evil the democratization of music through first of all pirating downloads to uh, what do they call it utorrent and then 
we all God, we all participated in that. Let's face it. And then yep. Spotify, Apple Music, or whatever other platforms might be tight title out there. They're really just broadcast mechanisms these days. Yeah, but they're and on that's demand, why I said, and the yeah. scale of it is the real issue. I think the scale of it, meaning you, we, you, you and I can go and meet our mates in Iceland or something like that, and listen to exactly the same music that we're listening to here. The whole thing's open globally. Yeah. Yeah, and then that's what I mean. It's 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 yeah, it's it's good and bad. Um, but uh, yeah, like it's it, it just uh, it it kind of is what it is. And uh, you know, you just again have to use these tools as as they are available. I guess you know, like um, mm. it would be much harder to get music, like uh, like much harder to self release music. I mean, I remember trying to self release music before things like Spotify and that existed, you know, and it was like, you had more you had more control and you'd obviously keep more revenue and things, but like also like your reach would be so much smaller, you know, like now you can have your music played all over the world and stuff like you say in that too. So have you got um, a cupboard, have you got a cupboard with a, with two or three boxes of CDs like what I've got? I do. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, back, back home. Like, Hey, I tend to not buy as many yeah. physical copies now, but this is why I say to people too, you know, it's like, I don't think people should ever feel guilty or anything like that about like how they consume music. But I will say that like, you know, if you do consume it through like a kind of, uh, um, you know, any of these platforms where you get like a lot of it on a subscription base, then just go and see these bands live, you know, yeah. go and buy tickets and go and buy shirt, buy shirts, merch. buy patches, yeah. buy merch or whatever, because that's all the money that goes directly into the band. Cause even if a band gets a record deal, you know, and it's like puts out an album and yeah. puts out vinyl and CDs and all these things, like they're not really seeing any of that back or anything, you know, that's the condition of that happening. You know, again, this is just, I guess, to explain to anybody who's not, in the music world that you know it doesn't understand fully how these things work but uh, you know a record deal is a mortgage for an album basically <laughs> except mm. at the end of it you don't get your album <laughs> um so you know that's why i'm like you know go out to shows and like because that's what the bands you know that's, that's what they prefer you know it's like they don't care how many people like you know take the music on spotify and like don't buy it on Bandcamp or whatever but just like go to a show and like buy a shirt and like you know get a, get a couple of things and talk to the bands or whatever it's like they probably appreciate that like a lot more because mm. that's what i say you know it's just like if if people are listening to it and it gets more people out to shows and things then um then that's good it just kind of pisses me off a bit that somebody somewhere is making a shit ton of money from it from my from our creativity oh, it's yeah. yeah it's terrible yeah, yeah it's a it's a shitty model but it's it's a democratic model at the very least and it ain't going anywhere god knows what the, the but the next evolution of it's going to be i can't imagine what it is but imagine going back 20 years ago and starting and trying to explain to a musician a streaming platform <laughs> can you imagine that yeah i know it's crazy how things go so like you say it'll be interesting to see how the future and that goes with it as well but um yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, these are tools to be used. And like, you know, bands can make their own decisions. You know, they can decide to not use any of these things and they can sell their tapes on street corners in only physical form, you know, um, if they want to. But again, like, it just, I guess it depends what you want to do with it and what you want your reach to be and like, you know, how many people you want to get it out there to. And, um, you know, using these necessary evils to try and like get it to the right place and, and hoping that it's some kid somewhere that can't afford to buy a CD, but, you know, he's... He's leeching off the family Spotify thing and he's sitting there like in his room listening to your music. He or she or they um are in, you know, a room somewhere just loving listening to your music. And I guess for me, like that's probably what's more important, even though I, I don't know whether that is what's happening or whatever. But um, you know, that's certainly what I was doing when I was um consuming music as a as a young, rebellious metal teenager. So um I hope that that's still going on. You know, I think that's what it is for me. I hope that it's not just I, I, what concerns me is the, the the accessibility and the overconsumption of it is like a little bit of a concern of mine because um you know i remember when i used to buy cds and stuff i would like buy a cd and i'd only listen to that cd for like two weeks you know and i would learn every lyric and every riff and every single yeah. change of that album like the back of my hand but and i feel it now too um you know bands are releasing like so much material so often you know going with the drive of the world that we live in and stuff like that too it's always going to be like right now and more and more and more um and obviously these companies like spotify and title and everything are all making money from it as well so they're just like keep creating guys keep making music bring it on spotify more people will listen to it we'll put you on playlists and stuff like that too and uh you know it kind of oversaturates the listening side of it so 
my concern is that like people, you know, are not digesting things for as long as they should be no, to really enjoy them. Of fatigue out there at the moment, mate. Yeah, people are relying on bloody Instagram shorts and or uh, what is it, YouTube shorts and Instagram reels. In yeah, particular. well, this is it. The video aspect of things as well is like a whole other realm to bring into it, and that too, you know, like of how you have to navigate it. Um, and yeah, it's just it's. I guess it's just about how much you want to get your music out there and how much you want to get it to people and what tools you're willing to use and you know mm. um to get to it but it was, it's ever changing and you know it's one of these things that i certainly feel as well that like i'm starting it's starting to make me feel old <laughs> because i'm just <laughs> like i can't tell if i'm just not interested in it or if i'm just like old and grumpy you know but i kind of just don't give as much of a shit about it now i'm like you know i'm like if you make good music and you you put it out to places and the right places and stuff and people hear it like at the end of the day like people will turn up to your shows you know like that's pretty much a guaranteed given so the the proof is in it right there i guess but yeah yeah that's where it is that's the arena the live arena and you mentioned on email i might might have misunderstood but do you broadcast with four trip sorry it's four, uh what is it down there three triple r uh, it's triple right? r no no yeah no no but i don't broadcast no that was actually for another interview for um ah right for, okay. for the ep and stuff as well yeah i thought yeah, i had so. a fellow broadcaster in my hands here and i thought wow that's no. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no no um no definitely not uh i mean i probably i probably could would be pretty good at radio actually i like to talk a lot of bullshit so like you know maybe it could be a I career choice be great for broadcasting on on three people uh <laughs> try and yeah. I, I know they i know they're, they're stacked like you know it's not like uh they have a want for broadcasters and presenters there but i think you'd be great at doing something like that oh, well thank you very much mate i appreciate that maybe i'll keep my eye open but uh yeah we did a we did a, a an interview with them those guys as well the other night so that was really good too just uh we're punching all the press out now for the obviously and the, the ep's out in two weeks now and yeah. we've been like you know since the single came out um at the end of january there we've just been like hammering it um you know talking to as many people as possible and just trying to get it out to all the places um you know that people might be interested in it and have nice things to say about it or bad things to say about it i don't really care either way you know i like hearing criticism of things too so um, what could anybody say about it that's bad for god's sakes you can you can say oh, it's not my cup of tea or what have you but then you wouldn't even bother saying that really it's wow. it comes down to it comes down to what you can find to like about it with in, independent metal releases that's how i've always approached it it's if you don't i don't think i've gotten a thing which i've not outright liked there's been some of the stuff that i think you've mentioned it that has been recorded very badly and the ideas in particular haven't been fleshed out across a song so mm -hmm. they've repeated things and they're just not really where or what, what's the woodhouse, chop house, warehouse things properly, whatever that term is. Yeah. They they need to go back in there and to your exact point earlier about the community that you've got there with uh Danger Tone Studios, they haven't worked out that maybe for months, maybe even for a couple of years, you just got to hammer it out in the studio and learn your chops. And by that way, learn where you're at. Not everybody's Steve DiGiorgio and not everybody's the guitarist from Obscura. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes you've just got to be the guy holding down E or whatever. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's what I mean. It's like you've just got to figure out like what you want to do with it and stuff. And, you know, I guess just not try not to be something that you're not or whatever as well. You know, it's like just you have to, yeah, just kind of like find your, find your, your place, your, your energy, your, your chi, your vibe, like whatever you want to call it. Whatever. Yeah, great way of putting it. And sometimes some people pick that up really quickly, you know what I mean? And um, sometimes it takes years and different experiences with different people breed to different things as well, you know? So like, there's always a lot of variables and stuff in there too, but the important thing is to never let the, you know, I guess the more negative feelings and stuff like that, like get it down, you know, like there's, there's shit times, you know, especially in interviews and stuff like that as well. You're always generally talking about the kind of more positive sides of things and stuff like that too. And a lot of people don't see the kind of shit that goes on in between um you know so um you know it always sounds a lot more streamlined than someone's like talking about it like the the kind of bare facts and stuff like that but um you know there's a lot of a lot of uh shit to wade through as well so mm -hmm. brother i'll wrap things up but before i do where and how can people purchase the ep that's coming out within two weeks and also where can people see you play so all our pre-orders, pre-saves, merchandise, and everything can be done from our gorgeous new website, which was designed by our drummer, Jared. Shout out to nice Jared, one. the web designer. Um, so that's muntgrind.com. 
Um, and there's access to absolutely everything there, like our YouTube, um, yeah, our merch store, pre-orders, pre-saves for digital platforms and stuff as well. Um, anywhere that you want to listen to it or anything like that. There's also like a little brief history of us and some nice pictures and things too. Um, so everything can be done from there. And we are working just now on a release show for the EP. Um, a date which is I'm not going to release just now because we're kind of like playing about with a couple of different ones. We're kind of like trying to the priority, I guess, for the release show is to really get the supports that we really want. We really mm. want it to be quite a special show in Melbourne um, with like, you know, like uh, a lot of like special friends of ours. Um, and we are just trying to match up people's schedules just now. It's obviously like people are still like coming out of COVID and stuff. Every band's just like, you know, hitting it hard as hell right now. So trying to just match up schedules along with like venues and stuff like that is just the uh, the, the challenge just now. Um, but yeah, there'll be a release show, which will be getting announced soon. And then we are going to be touring at the end of the year, um, which I also can't really announce or talk about yet because it's also still being, uh, put together, but it will be a great tour with another amazing Australian band and we're hitting a lot of places. So I guess I would say to people like, you know, like just yeah, keep an eye out on the socials and stuff. Like we'll be putting lots up, obviously as the EP comes out as well, we will be announcing things as that comes through. Um, and so it's all kind of yeah done done through the regular social places and through the through the website muntgrind.com uh, for everything that you need to hear from us. And on Facebook and Instagram, I think it's Munt Grind as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's Munt yeah. Grind across everything. Like cool. uh, you know, we want yeah, it to a generalized, simplistic thing for people to remember. So mm. I'll put the uh, the social links into the episode, the show episode, mate. When I send it out, when I broadcast it, so people will know where to go anyway. Yeah, sweet man, and thank you so much for getting us on it and stuff as well, man. We really appreciate like yeah, everybody that's had interest in it, and especially people that have very nice things to say about it too. Like we have all been very involved in this process, and I think like we've none of us like ever think particularly highly of things once we get to the end result of this because yeah. it comes very much about the drive of the release, and so we don't really have time to sit about and smell the roses, as it were. So um, it's yeah, it's very nice to know that people are already starting to enjoy it. So we're very excited about getting it out there into the world, and then getting on with what's coming next as well. Like I said, we're all writing and stuff just now. So this is very much just the kind of beginning of our revitalization and people should expect a lot more very, very cool things in the future. So yeah, well, well done with it, man. Congratulations. But it sounds killer, by the way. I've got a copy, obviously, and I've listened to it a yeah. couple of times. And what I hear, mate, is just a band that knows exactly what's going on. Talking about knowing where you're, the symbiosis of things, you know where you're at, you do because what you've set out to achieve, I believe you've done, it's just brutal, no bullshit grindcore right there. Sweet, well, I'm glad that we've achieved that mission goal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, brother. Have a great night. Thanks very much for the chat. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. Speak to you soon. So there he is, ladies and gentlemen, Spud Robertson from the band from Melbourne called Munt, or is it Munt? Either way, that's who you heard from lively fella enjoyed that chat right there now if you liked that conversation there are plenty more just like it over at scarsandguitars.com in particular if you're a fan of old school cradle of filth the 90s era that's all i'm interested in with that group do check out my cradle of filth conversations because recently i had a chat with the group's foundation guitarist paul ryan it's going gangbusters online and there's good reason for that because so many layers the band's early years are shrouded in mystery and these layers are just being torn away now and you can get to the bottom of what made the band tick back then Danny Filth that sort of thing yeah enjoyable stuff but it's not just about Cradle of Filth the Scars and Guitars far from it as a matter of fact I've interviewed so many of the leading lights of hard rock heavy metal extreme metal and beyond this morning I just spoke to Michael Sweet from Striper to give you an idea and Eric Rutan the legendary Eric Rutan, the death metal master blaster himself. He does the introduction to the show to give you an idea of the span of people that I enjoy talking to on the show. So dive into the chats that are available there, but not just podcast episodes. I've written a book, Scars and Guitars, Volume 1, Conversations from the World of Heavy Metal and Beyond. Click on the link in the banner on the website and you'll be taken to a marketplace of your choice in which you can download a sample. And if you do complete the purchase, hit me up because I want to thank you personally. So there's some more information to share with you about the book in the moment, but I need to bid you a fond farewell. 
Before we get to that, my name is Andrew Mackay-Smith and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast, broadcasting to you directly from the Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia. Until next time, it is a very good bye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Ball Gear write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he, he was very, you know, very open-minded and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for, for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five and Manson gave me that name and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.